Uh, I have some questions, but I'll hold them. Uh, er, er, Ernie, and then Guy, and then Steve. So if I understand the last point, it's that you should be worried that the state secretary, the state secretary of state, will be sufficiently afraid of you that they'll do Heather's thing. Doesn't that just make you a millier, but a sneakier millier? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's called second order millier. <laughs> 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 All right, Sandy. Um, <clears throat> so what's missing, I think, from your account is the ways that change happen as a result of structural mechanisms, right? So you bring up the Tea Party as your closing example of, a, of, of hope in some respect, at least one version of hope, right, of how change can happen. And I look at the Tea Party and I think, um, in my perspective, that's just the mechanism to which to shrink the Republican Party so that way it is no longer a relevant dominant party over the next 10 or 15 years. Right? I don't see it as, um, as using the structural mechanisms that prevent change from happening. Right? So as between meliorism and bomb throwing, it seems that we need to think about the structural mechanisms. And you've thought about some of that, for example, the Senate as one example. Uh, but what are, what are the uh, ways that you have from getting us from here to there other than try to be as scary as possible, right? In ways that address the structural uh, impediments to change. Um, I mean, one basic issue is what you want from government. If you want to prevent legislation, um, if you believe that, you know, as imperfect as the present situation is, mo the probability is that most suggested changes will make it worse. Then the Tea Party is following a perfectly rational strategy. Uh, they might ha some people might have a legislative program that they cannot conceivably expect to see passed, but second best, and it's a high second best, is to make sure that no democratic program is passed. Um, and you know, I, I think that, that is one of the, the, the current political realities. Um, I think one of the things we really have to do is have you know, a model of, well, how has significant change taken place in this country over time? The most significant constitutional change, that is the Reconstruction Amendments, took place, as Chairman Mao would suggest, at the point of a gun. Um, and um, you, know, you, you can look at other changes that, even if not so dramatic, either in terms of orthodox constitutional law or the events of 1861, 1865, um, which <coughs> killed 700,000 people and maimed and injured many, many others. Uh, still, there is the fear of, you know, of armies. Again, metaphorical more more than, than actual. Now, you know, perhaps the most quixotic aspect of my call for a convention is that I want delegates to be selected more or less at random, and to have a couple of years to debate a whole number of issues. Because uh, I don't have in my pocket the Levinson Constitution that would resolve all these issues. First of all, I don't think we can resolve all these issues. Politics always is going to be um, you know, balancing off certain considerations. I dislike intensely life tenure on the Supreme Court, but I would trade life tenure in a second you know, in return uh, for getting rid of equal voting power in the Senate or a whole number of other uh, imperfections. Um, others, I genuinely don't know what my thoroughly informed opinion would be, uh, you know, what kind of presidential as opposed to a more parliamentary system. So I would want two years of a convention 
um, in which we could really, you know, hash, it would be the ultimate, as one of my students at Georgetown would say, it would be the ultimate reality television show, um, <laughs> in which people would hash these things out and there would be a public debate about how to get there from here. Now, some of this also, I mean, the 17th Amendment, there are, 17th Amendment, which was an extremely important change in the Constitution, um, it negated any plausible argument that the United States Senate has anything to do with protecting federalism. As a result of the 17th Amendment, the Senate is an affirmative action program for the residents of small states and nothing else. Prior to the 17th Amendment, you could make a plausible, albeit you know, <coughs> argument, that the ability of state legislatures to pick senators might have generated senators who actually cared either, depending on the language you use, either preserving the autonomy of state institutions or staying within the parchment barriers of constitutional federalism. Since the 17th Amendment, we simply know beyond reasonable doubt that the Senate is not a structural protection for state autonomy, though it does a wonderful job of protecting the agricultural interests of the upper Midwest. Um, um, because of the voting rules. Um, how do we get the 17th Amendment? Part of the reason is that there was actually a movement for a constitutional convention. Um, and it was perceived, apparently, as threatening enough that the last holdouts in the Senate acquiesced to an amendment that, not surprisingly, had passed the House of Representatives, I think beginning sometime in the 1880s. You know, why should the House of Representatives, most of whom detest senators and the United States Senate, why should they do anything to maintain the Senate in its present form? But you can easily <coughs> imagine in good Madisonian fashion why members of the Senate would want to preserve the Senate in its present form. So it really does seem to me, you know, that part of thinking about political reform, and you know, second order meliorism is not the worst thing one could be accused of, but it is pointing out that meliorists need bomb throwers, just as bomb throwers need people who will appear to be and are in fact more moderate and more likely to be described by the editorial page of the New York Times as thoughtful and reasonable <laughs> than <laughs> are you know, the bomb throwers. So a small comment and a question. The comment is, there's a quote by William Lloyd Garrison you may want to use, where someone asked, why are you advocating immediate abolition of slavery when the only real politically realistic thing is gradual abolition? Mm -hmm. Garrison said, I know it's going to be gradual, uh, but the only way to get to gradual is to advocate immediate yep. Uh, yep. abolition. Yep. Uh, my question, though, is that in your remarks on election administration, sort of the assumption seems to be that if we had a unitary, centralized system of election administration at the federal government level, things would be better, but you know, maybe they would, I don't know, but uh, there, there are two problems that might arise. One is, uh, if someone like Catherine Harris, one of these other people that you have uh, sort of pilloried, um, where, where, the, where the federal <laughs> election administrator, it seems like they would probably behave just as mm -hmm. badly at that level as before, uh, as at the state level. Secondly, when you decentralize, at least sort of Republican bias in some states is offset by Democratic bias in uh, other states and vice versa, whereas if you have a centralized administrative system, whatever bias they had would be imposed in the entire country. So Catherine Harris, if she was in charge, would be able to, you know, have the entire system right. everywhere be biased to the Republicans, and if it's right. a Democrat, you know, it would go the other way. So it would actually magnify uh, the effects of whatever bias it would yeah. exist. No, that's a fair question. I think there, I mean, the most obvious answer to it is that you would not want the federal election agency to <coughs> be partisan or to be appointed by partisans. You would want it to be somewhat more in structure like the CIA or the FBI or the Federal Reserve, that is... They never do anything partisan. The, uh, well, they, no, they do a lot of things that are very, very objectionable to a lot of people. 
but rarely partisan in the crassest sense of how can I help elect my guy to office. Um, and, um, you know, that I, I realize that's possible. But the way we handle, or you can think of the federal judiciary. Uh, I don't like life tenure, but I certainly support, say, 18 year terms for members of the U.S. Supreme Court. I think that's enough to get the value of judicial independence without saying that they can serve quite literally to death do we part. Um, but it does seem to me that if you had, you know, if, if we had a conception of the civil service as, you know, committed to certain public values, including the values that Heather really lays out very, very well in her book about kind of the minima we expect from elections and are so often found wanting in lots of states that if you want to vote, you should be able to register fairly easily to vote and not find yourself the subject of you know, illegitimate hindrances to voting initially. And then on election day, if you want to vote, there should be a place you can vote that's actually convenient. And then, of course, there are even the more volatile questions of if you vote, will your vote in fact be counted? Um, that it seems to me that one could imagine that people would recognize this is of a, a fundamental importance um, and that we could find good people to administer this. <clears throat> now, you know. Is there a danger of capture? I suppose there is, um, but it seems to me that we should be able to design mechanisms to you know, pretty much ensure against that, the kind of capture you describe. And we do know that capture is rife, not only at the state level, but as Heather points out, most elections are, in fact, sub-state. So, um, you know, as it turns out, George Bush should always send, you know, a case of scotch to the Democratic um, election official who designed the lunatic butterfly ballot, which is what explains George Bush's coming out ahead of Al Gore in um, um, Florida. So she can't be accused of throwing the election in a way that Catherine Harris, but she can be accused of being incompetent. And one might wish to have better officials at all levels. Um, I also guess, I, you know, you, you could also control for some of this if you got rid of the Electoral College, and then it wouldn't matter so much. But, you know, we normally think, well, the Republicans will throw one state illegitimately to their guy, but that's all right, because the Democrats will throw another state illegitimately to their guy. Maybe I would feel more, you know, assured, given that my politics, you know, you, if I don't know, I'm sorry, if you haven't already guessed them by, by <laughs> Googling me, you know, I, I, I wish there were a battleground state in which I had confidence that there were Democrats who were trying to figure out a way to throw it to Obama. When I look at the current electoral map, all I see is a group of Republicans in a number of battleground states who I suspect will do everything they can on November 6th to get what they view as the right turnout. Um, so I don't think empirically this kind of you know, invisible hand, it'll all work out for the best is anything um, that people should feel, you know, that should take any, any comfort in.
Heather had a question, and, and that was the last question. Uh, but for since I work with the advancement project and do vote expression, anti-vote expression work <laughs> <laughs> across, across the country, I'd be happy to share horror stories with any of you in the break. <laughs> This is not a rebuttal. I know I get rebuttals later, but I, I actually did have a question about thinking about your life as a scholar. And the one benefit of having a session shift and, uh, is that you can correct. Mid-course correction is possible when it happens on the early end. So, so as I sit here between you and Ernie, and Ernie's whispering madly in my ear during <laughs> your talk, it's not only, uh, and I'm feeling a little schizophrenic since Ernie thinks I'm an insane bomb thrower, and you think I'm, no, no, no. I'm a genius. <laughs> but, I, but, but there's actually there's a different tension, I think, in the life of an academic than the one you identified, and I wonder how you think about this. So when I think about the work that I've done so far, I think about my constitutional theory work, which is where my heart is, where I feel like I'm making more of a contribution to the world of scholarship. Uh, that there's a theoretical contribution there that I can I feel like I can identify and, and, and move. And then I think about the what stuff that has actually mattered to anyone outside the academy. Uh, and I will just say, uh, so this idea that prompted the book was a 700-word editorial. I was pretty sure that as an academic, it was not worth more than a 700-word editorial because there's it's not a scholarly contribution. David Slaker was kind enough to write the last chapter of the book, the one I didn't write since it was a, a quasi-popular book, um, which gave the sort of theoretical frame for the book, but that wasn't in there because it was intended to influence policymakers. And then I'll just note that, that you know, that 700-word editorial, which isn't worth my scholarly time, prompted bills by Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton within two months, um, has had a major foundation that's put a huge amount of resources into building a democracy index, we may actually get to find out, Sandy, uh, <laughs> who's right and who's wrong on this one. Um, but but the uh, you know when you sort of think about your life as a scholar, we've moved so far from the world that we used to be in. I mean, Judge Edwards has made this point, the one of sort of practical lawyering and problem solving. And the academy is much more theoretically oriented now than it was before, and the work we do is much more distant. And I would say that's true of your other hat is political science. Mm -hmm. Political scientists don't actually have anything to say about politics anymore, almost nothing. Uh, I mean, it's just shocking uh, that that's true. Oh, David, you're just wrong about this. Yeah, <laughs> um, so, you know, so, so how should we think about our lives as scholars when, when the contributions that matter inside the academy are actually quite different from what matter outside? That's actually a fabulous question. Um, A couple of things come to mind. First of all, I think that, you know, certainly when I entered the legal academy, and, you know, even afterward, the model of the law professor was what Harry Edwards still thinks it should be. I mean, I was one of the people Edwards was going after in his essay condemning recent, you know, in the legal academy, because his conception of the law professor is that we, we were reformers, but the, our reformism took the form of writing briefs to judges, though we called them articles, but we took some topic that was on the docket of the Supreme Court or a circuit court and wrote an article, here's how you should come out. And you know, each year the Harvard Law Review and the November issue would grade the Supreme Court in the previous term. You know, did you get it right or not? <laughs> and the first major change in the, I mean, the biggest change in the academy is exactly what you put your finger on, that a lot of law professors stop writing for judges. Um, sometimes because we really didn't care if they were reading our stuff. Sometimes, coming back to the issue, because we knew they weren't. Um, they, most of them expressed no interest in our stuff, except when it fit their own ideological presuppositions. Um, uh, so, you know, why do this? Now, it's also true, as Richard Posner and other people pointed out, there were internal developments in the Legal Academy. We became more like what I often call the real academy. Uh, there are more joint degree, degree people, but there is this move toward theory. 
and then really to get to the heart of your question, I think it's true that from one perspective, you know, theorists are indifferent to what they're describing. Um, you know, I've done a lot of work for the Harvard School of Public Health, and he, he looks at a variety of vi uh, viruses. And as a scholar, he's really interested in how the viruses multiply and might indeed kill us all. Now, you know, he also has views about whether they should multiply. <laughs> but, but, you know, his first work is, you know, how does this operate? How does it work? And so from one perspective, you know, the academic interest is curiosity, um, which Judge Edwards hated my use of that word, that we should be motivated by what we're curious about. Uh, rather than what would help judges. But then there is the other role of being a citizen, where we really care about these outcomes, that we, you know, and that how do we balance this? And I think that we have come to a collective decision that to the extent we are active citizens, writing quasi-briefs for judges is, if not a waste of our time, it really doesn't represent the highest and best use of our talents. On occasion, it certainly is a good thing to write a brief, but write a real brief, the way that Gerald has just done with regard to the Fisher case that will be argued in the first Tuesday, uh, I guess it's just next week, um, that involves the University of Texas and the affirmative action programs, et cetera. Why go through you know, I don't want to call it the charade, but when I go through, you know, try writing an old-time law review article. But I think we're also recognizing not that courts are unimportant, but they're far, far less important than the received wisdom in the legal academy. That if you want change, you have to often have to get legislation. I would argue on occasion you may even need constitutional amendment. And you're not going to get it through even the most clever arguments to a judge. You, your audience is going to be the, you know, the change agents. And then you have to have a model in the back of your head. Will they perform as change agents simply because they read a really good book that you write? Or because they also fear that you might persuade a lot of ordinary citizens to start holding their feet to the fire. And we'll say, we're going to fire you from being Secretary of State in the next election because you're just a partisan hack. And you don't really care that we're number 48 in the list of 50 states uh, with regard to you know, basic access to to the ballot. But it does seem to me that, that what you described is really a poignant truth. Um, and I mean, there's always been a tension between detached scholarship and you know, the buzzword of relevance. And I think what you're really talking about is should scholars strive for relevance in the first place? And if the answer is yes, then how do you do it? You know, what's your target audience? And it may very well be, just to repeat for one final point, that the target audience for, if you're interested in elections and election reform, is not a judge. Sometimes it might be. You know, on voter ID laws, you, know, you can't write too many articles and too many briefs denouncing the voter ID laws and the Supreme Court's decision in Crawford. But with what you're talking about, you know, it's really much more important actually to change the legislation and change the, the incentive structures. And you don't do that by you know, writing to judges. But I, as I say, I think your question really gets to the heart of every one of these you know, scholarship weekends that what do you want scholarship to do? Um, and I think your book is superb, even if it's not going to be your most permanent contribution to high theory. So what? 
Thank you.